Her work reminds us of the interconnectedness of all life and the environments that support them. Um, our artists are going to present on their recent work um, and discuss how both materially and conceptually living systems inspire their distinctive practices. So first up, we uh, will hear from Selena. Um, uh, she, as I mentioned, is an interdisciplinary artist uh, based in Tasmania, uh, seeking out materials environments that have weathered various forms of frontline disturbance. Selena positions herself in the role of both witness and interpreter. Her practice often presents a provocation to tune into the environment by amplifying the voices of more than human entities. And so please make Selena really welcome and I'll hand over the mic and camera to Selena. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to also acknowledge that my work takes place in the Twitter and um, the Muwanina and Palawa Pakana people. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me, bear with me for a moment because I realise now that I'm not at my first slide. Um, okay. Hi, thanks Experimenter for welcoming me onto your platform. You find me in the final leg of my PhD, which is to say you find me ensnared in the passage of linear institutional time. That said, it's an incredible privilege to spend my attention in this way. And I'm questioning many things. One is the role of artistic production in our society during this great wounding of the sixth extinction, or as Tom Van Doren might say, what does it mean to inherit responsibility? Through my process, I seek out materials and environments that have weathered various forms of frontline disturbance, positioning myself in both the role of witness and interpreter. Some key concerns that live within my practice include relationship, interconnection, ecological imagination, and listening. These are transformed into poetic gestures that creatively story acts of witnessing or what Bayo Akamal Afe would call with, witnessing, being with more than human witnesses to ecological disturbance. These inquiries give rise to assemblages of solidarity as a methodology and as ways for living addressing these questions speculatively and directly. How might I align my practice to be inclusive? How might I consider the citizenship of more than human beings, amplifying and raising their voices in various contexts? Who can I bring with me into the gallery or the so-called cultural space in efforts to dissolve false binaries? To witness is to make public to hold oneself and be held accountable. As Dylan Robertson says, witnessing is becoming an archive, watching and being watched. It's not surveillance, but knowledge storied and situated within community, a form of relational accountability. This act of bearing witness is later cracked open through creative translation in attempts to represent or speak for those that may not be linguistic. It's a melding of research, intuition, and experimentation. The forest is a memory, a teacher for community building, the alliance of trees, soil, mycelium, and collaborative webs of living and non-living entities. Trees reveal themselves as masterful, multi-agent, ecological engineers and world makers. Forests are animate in that they are endowed with life and they animate providing the conditions for living. Trees are not autonomous machines for producing wood and forests are not systems. Tiger Brain would point out, as hard as we might try to contain the world in neat technological metaphor, it will always leak out and transform us. We can all grasp that technology is watching, listening to and tracking us. But what if Earth is similarly perceptive? 
Is the soil keeping track? As Monica Gagliano has scientifically proven something First Nations have always known, that all life is cognitive and conscious of its life world, that trees emit audible clicking sounds, communicate, communicating with one another, they have memory and can associate and hear subground water sources. Perhaps the question is who is observing who? For some years, I've been visiting forests scheduled for Clearfell, vastly diverse ancient ecologies doomed to violent bioprospecting ends. There's a long legacy of mismanagement and corrupt industry supported here in the Twitter. Connecting and spending time in these places, making myself quiet and still, becoming attentive as a method for noticing. Sometimes sitting in one spot for a day, sometimes wearing a blindfold and no shoes and making my way. Or in the instance of this in image, alongside Forestry Watch, a self-organized community group who audit forest logging plans, tagging paths for wayfinding through a scheduled coop. This practice of field philosophy includes collecting samples. Samples take the form of audio visual field recordings alongside physical souvenirs. These are woven into installations and at times include participatory activation. Although discrete in scale, these samples suggest relation to larger forces, referencing particular environmental sites or specific moments of disturbance. For example, in 2019, I collected bushfire air as well as the 2020 summer fires, bottling atmosphere, memorializing the particulate mattering of combusted ecologies, vessels to hold the spirits of the incinerated. Returning to places I lived amongst when I first moved to La Chuita, forests there in 2001, since Gondwana, no longer exist outside of memory. I am instead confronted with the short-lived speed of a stolen joyride torched and dumped incongruous alongside the surrounding temporality of ecology. So the seizure is a term that describes a form of emotional or existential distress caused by environmental change, a word for this ominous feeling of receding biodiversity a word for this gaping absent presence. During April of 2020, 356,000 hectares of previously protected native forests were released for clear felling. Vast interspecies communities essentially deemed disposable, made abstract through bioprospecting pathways of commodification. Driving to the back country, past the hills hoist lynched in high-vis garments, roads streaked with burnouts, the maypole of cable logging creeping down the two dangerous steep embankments. This mode of investigation strategically identifies locations to visit as field research to finally translate as artworks, amplifying the plight of the more than human. This act of field research could also be framed as a form of dark tourism, traveling to sites that are in some way connected to death or disaster. Tree roots embedded in soil knitted together with fungi are major communication networks where nutrients, secrets and information are stored and shared. Empathy apparently can be manufactured from the roots of some trees. Sassafras roots and leaves once refined are a source for saffron, the key ingredient in MDMA. The drug releases large amounts of serotonin, which likely causes the emotional closeness, elevated mood and empathy felt by those humans who use it. For this work, ready-made burnout, the root of happiness, I handcrafted a ceramic alembic. This traditional distilling technology was set above the beaker, filled with sassafras, roots and leaves gathered from a logged forest. Bubbling away over the course of the exhibition, the scent of the slain forest with its empty promise of ecstasy filled the lungs of those that visited. The refined liquid was funneled through exhausted pipes retrieved from the burnout car bodies, speculating on material states of short-lived pleasure 
embroiled in the petro-colonial complex of fast thrills. To be clear, most ecstasy is not produced from the roots of sassafras, but from chemicals imported from China and the Netherlands is also a major manufacturer. MDMA is becoming increasingly accepted as a mental health treatment for depression. And according to SBS, Australians are the world's biggest individual consumers of ecstasy. So I guess I'm drawing wild, unfounded connections between mental health and the recreational seeking of pleasure and a disconnect with healthy soil and diverse ecologies. Healthy soil is a known serotonin stimulator. Serotonin is produced in the human gut. The health of soils and the health of humans are intertwined as microbial organisms. Serotonin is the key hormone that stabilizes our mood, feelings of well being, and happiness. On the banks of the mighty Huon River, one of the logging arteries of state supported ecocide, exists a cult like petroleum ritual. Smoldering car bodies like crumpled, sacrificed next to an illegal squatter's hobo shack. This, this gothic scene is the bruise you can't remember getting that continues revealing itself days after the mystery event. This neo-colonial legacy provokes the unsettling introspection of who are we culturally. Before and during lockdown, I had been working with bonnets collected from these stolen dumped wrecks, questioning the thieved nature of the artifact made it more compelling, and whether this is perhaps another colonial fetish. Paradoxically, the patina of a burnt car is landscape abstraction par excellence. Vandina Shiva reminds us, for too long has the human mind been limited to thinking like a machine. Mechanistic thought has allowed humans to unleash violence on other species, both plants and animals. Ecocentric thinking, thinking with plants and other species will help humans by understanding the sanctity and continuity of life and our place in the earth family. Living ecologies flow with personalities particular to specific relational tangles with place. Disturbed environments tend to have ubiquitous, homogenizing qualities. Most logged forests I have visited are inhabited with a haunting lack of definition defined by absence. The day the first person in Latwita, Tasmania died of COVID-19, was also the day forestry firebombed a coop I had been visiting for some time. They fell, then burned the forest to eradicate the seedbed of rainforest species, encouraging eucalyptus regrowth. It was formerly the nesting ground of the endangered swift parrot. These birds are nectivores, nomads who follows the sporadic blossoming pattern of eucalyptus globulus. They're summer breeding residents. It takes at least 140 years before a tree is capable of making nest-worthy hollows. Ecologies are vastly intergenerational and inter interspecies. Crafting these reclaimed car bodies as amplifier cones, I amplified the voice of swift parrots alongside recordings that listen to the internal dialogue of eucalyptus globulus that remains standing on the fringes of the logged coop. The tree body acting as an antenna, I drilled a screw into the trunk, attaching contact mics, listening to the wind in the dancing limbs. While visiting these frontline sites of disturbance, I had a sleeve made for my car exhaust, which I used to collect particulate matter to create black ink. Attempting to translate moving through the environment as a contemporary human, my relationship with earth, while at the same time being complicit in activities that render the world vulnerable. This carbon ink was mixed with water drawn from Vatnajorgo, a melting Icelandic glacier. Each phase is adorned with beeswax and white pigment sourced from plasterboard found in skip bins, burnt surfaces, of charcoal and 23 karat gold leaf gifted to me. Precious material fragments that combine hopelessness with the inevitable phase of massive change we are living through. 
the desire to reconcile my relationship with the world around me is juxtaposed with the elements of the world as we experience it being put at risk by humankind itself. How might we come together and listen with absence? This framework of witnessing is further informed by the Australian Earth Laws Alliance and Earth Jurisprudence as termed by Thomas Berry. This field of law works to embed the ethos that all of nature has the right to exist, thrive and persist with a within a particular jurisdiction, e.g. a nation, a region or a local area. By formally acknowledging the legal rights of the environment to exist, these laws can reposition nature as much more than just a resource for human exploitation, echoing once again First Nations custodial role of reciprocity towards ecology. Earth's jurisprudence asks, who is it that gets to speak for the environment? Closing in 2013, Queenstown had the longest operational copper mine in Australia. The violent branding of empire is gouged out of terrestrial strata with nomenclature derived from the monarchy staked into country and stamped onto maps. The King River is just down the track and further north the Savage River harbours its own toxic mine bequest. The result of over 100 years of capitalist driven experiments. Again, extracting labour exchanged for abstracted commodities has transformed the local environment into an earth laboratory. There's so much trauma concealed in plain sight. A toxic glitch amidst pristine world heritage rainforests. This place is surreal and at times unsettling, partly because it is also strangely compelling and beautiful. The surrounding hillsides are rock bare, the result of acid rain which permeated the atmosphere through a smelting technique, which concluded in 1969. It subsequently melted the green ecology throughout the valley. With no plants to hold the ground in place, the high volume of rainfall between two and three metres a year has eroded the topsoil down to the bedrock. In Queenstown, the boundary between science fiction and reality is porous. In 2016, I was in India for another project and traveled to Thudakudi, where the parent company of the Queenstown mine resides, processing ore with cheap human labor and loose environmental regulations. The Queen River gushes like a throffy turmeric latte, breaking the rainforest with a haunting gift of pollution persistently rushing towards the ocean, spreading heavy metals like deep time fairy dust. How can something dead be so animated by movement? The river has a pH of four, it's extremely acidic. As Namanus points out, the waters that comprise us are never neutral. Their flows are directed by intensities of power and empowerment. Currents of water are also currents of toxicity, queerness, coloniality, sexual difference, global capitalism, imagination, desire, and multi species community. With hands soiled from earth dug from Queenstown, I crafted amplifier cones of wild clay body. In response to chemist Brenda Mooney's research, I then glazed these cones with toxic sludge from the acid mine runoff of the Queen River. Brenda's research thinks with the possibilities for recapturing minerals from what she affectionately terms sludge in the river and mine drainage pipes. Sludge is a concentrated residual alluvial metals, toxins, and in some spots, what Brenda speculates may be small amounts of biological matter. Her research seeks to harness the perceived need from mine owners to keep the drainage pipes flowing and in so doing, reduce the toxic load entering the hydro commons while simultaneously hoping to develop a product that has economic viability and remediation value. To these amplifier cones, I attached bone transducers, a form of speaker. 
These transducers are copper coiled around a magnet and when enlivened with electrical current vibrate the baked earth. Hydrophone recordings amplifying the voice of the dead river. Imagine this river that sounds like any other, full of movement, giggling over rocks, singing with the beyond language song of poison. I also gifted the river a futile homeopathic dose of ash, an alkaline substance that is sometimes used in acid mine drainage remediation. This work, if a dead river could speak, what would they say, explores how caring gestures towards the ecological and geological world may influence how we story the more than human. How do we interact with and care for environments? Contradictory stories dwell side by side, slowing down, becoming attentive to and tending political ecologies, as Demos would say, while enacting resistant forms of care requires attention, bridging time and place, technologies and hegemony. Remarkably, the trees line the banks, witness to this disturbance. They manage the seemingly impossible and suck life out of death. That's it. Stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Selena, for that beautiful presentation with um, some absolutely <laughs> extraordinary imagery you've got there. Um, I'm going to now um, introduce um, Svenja and remind all of uh, all of the people that have joined us that there will be opportunity for Q and A at the end. So, um, if questions come up while artists are presenting, please type them into the chat function, and I'll. Um, I'll uh, put the questions to our artists uh, in the Q&A at the end. So now I'm um, delighted to introduce Svenja Kratz, a media artist um, interested in transdisciplinary creative practice, particularly at the intersections between science and art. Her work engages with contemporary biotechnologies, most recently working with cell lines, interrogating the human desire for immortality and the concept of genetic legacy. And I'll hand you over to the capable hands of Svenja Kratz. Um, thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, that's great. Um, just give me a moment and I'll get my um, slideshow up and share my screen. So I'm hoping you can all um, see my slides now. And before I begin, I would also just like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land from which I'm presenting today, um, the Muwanina and the Palawa and Pakana peoples of Nipaluna and Lutruwita. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to thank Experimenta for inviting me to share my work as part of the Experimenta um, Life Forms Exhibition Focus and, for, uh, um, and to Jonathan Parthen, Parsons and Nikki Pastore for moderating the session today. So I'm going to begin my presentation um, today with a short introduction to provide some context for my practice more broadly um, and also for the works that I'll be discussing today. So as Jonathan has already uh, mentioned, as a visual artist, I've really always been interested in the body um, and the body in relation to technology, uh, including biotechnologies. And during my PhD, I was really fortunate um, to have the opportunity to work across art and science um, at the Queensland University of Technology and to become actively integrated in the then tissue repair and re regeneration group, which was really a research team that focused on wound healing with expertise in cell and tissue culture. And as part of this engagement, I was trained by um, different team members um, and actually learnt how to culture a variety of different cells, human and animal, um, and really how to work in a lab context. So on this slide, um, you'll be able to see um, the first flask of cells that I ever received, which was a fairly hardy um, cell line SAUS2. 
Um, and the, 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 the term SARS-2 actually references their origin as sarcoma osteogenic. So it's a bone cancer cell line. Um, it's a cell line that was also initially established in the 1970s um, from an 11 year old girl, which um, I've named Alice. And these cells, as indicated on the slide here within that flask, are grown in a single layer on the base of that flask um, within a liquid nutrient medium, which is the sort of pinky um, thing that you can see there. What really struck me about these um, cells, though, was that as cancer cells, they were essentially immortalized. So and that may basically means that they can reproduce well beyond the standard roughly 50 divisions that are reserved for um, healthy cells, which is known as the Hayflick limit. As such, they can um, essentially continue to replicate and be split into more and more um, culture flasks as they fill up the available space, um, which is sort of, again, sort of demonstrated on that slide. And that is a process called passaging. So when I started working with um, the cells and during this kind of continual culture, I really started to observe that the cells are not inert, but really highly responsive to different um, culture conditions, um, including changes in the liquid nutrient medium. And over the first six months or so, I also started to notice that the cells really looked quite different from the original cells um, that I started with. They became quite sluggish and some of the cells also started um, to seem to, to be multinucleated, to have more than one nucleus, which was, is really abnormal for those particular cells. And that's also why lower passage cells, so cells that have um, not been split so many times or cultured for as long, are preferred because um, they have less chance of, re of mutation and are there, therefore are more in line with the established characteristics of the cell line. So, you know, these sort of um, observations um, of the cells working with them and noting um, transformations um, was really influential in um, the response in the works that I developed in response to my experiences um, in the lab. And a lot of that also reflected on the uncanniness of the SARS-2 cell, cell line and the way in which the cells are like these living fragments of an absent body. Um, the cells themselves also, of course, retain the intimate connection to the original donor, Alice, um, because they, of course, contain her DNA. But at the same time, they're also representative of her disease. Um, and again, the more that you're, you're culturing them, the more they um, tend to change and mutate and evolve. So these um, observations were translated into the development of several interrelated works under the um, collective title, The Absence of Alice, that commented on the origins of the cell lines, but also foregrounded these kind of notions of continual becoming. So on this slide, you can see the work um, 78 Impressions of a Single Object, um, for example, that reflected on the repetitive process of growing and splitting and splitting Alice's bone cancer cells. Um, and you can see in the, in, in the image there that they're actually made of plaster, which was chosen because that material um, is often associated with mold making and also the process of duplication. And although all of the impressions, um, which were of a single bone-like object, um, were all from that same object, they were all really unique because the resulting shape was really determined by the impression process. So the angle, the pressure, and also the dryness of the plaster. Um, over time, as I sort of took these impressions, um, the, the plaster also started adhering to the object itself. So um, they, they were all became really different. So in this way, the work sort of responds to the idea of continual transformation um, in response to environment and also experience, but also highlights the impossibility of gaining an absolute understanding of any organism or system um, because our results or our impressions are often really highly dependent on that particular temporal moment um, and also the methods that are being used. 
So that particular work um, connected to the companion piece, Fragments of a Body in the Process of Becoming Other, which further commented on this continual transformation of Alice's cells. And the impressions that you can see on those slides were actually made from liquid latex, which were mixed with um, Alice's fixed cells, um, which I had collected during every um, passage. And these um, casts were displayed on a series of perspex um, sheets um, in passage order with the date and number inscribed on the side of the panel. So these works really signal a starting point in working um, with cell culture, but my interest in cell lines was um, further developed during a residency at um, Symbiotica, which is a centre for excellence in the biological arts at UWA um, in 2000. And as part of this engagement, I worked um, uh, quite a lot with HEC293T cells. So these cells are also a cell line, um, so immortalized cells, um, where the designation HEC refers to their origin as human embryonic kidney cells. The number 293 documents the number of experiments required to immortalize the cells, um, which was done using um, sheared adenovirus 5 DNA. Um, and finally, the T signals a further alteration to the cells through the incorporation of, um, uh, of the simian virus 40 large T antigen, which um, is a bit of a mouthful, but it really just refers to a specific protein from an animal virus. And the addition of that protein essentially rendered um, the cell line more easy to transfect. So to introduce additional genetic material, RNA, um, DNA or RNA into the cell. So what is also interesting to note about the HEC cell line is that the original um, cell line HEC293 has since spawned a whole range of subcultures or daughter cells, including um, 12 sort of quote tribes, um, catalogued by researchers in 2018, including HEC293T, of course, along with 11 others, including HEC293S, HEC293F, HEC293FT, and so on and so on. And there are um, now even more. So, what really struck me about working with the hex cells was how an organism that essentially never really reached full gestation could nonetheless result in a whole series of unique microorganisms with different traits that as um, Oren Katz and Jonat Zer from the Tissue Culture and Art um, Project assert, start to really resist easy, um, quote, biological or um, cultural classifications, end quote. And um, furthermore, the total biomass of the resulting cells, as they've also sort of asserted, often vastly outweigh the original body from which they were derived, um, which is definitely the case um, for hex cells and the various derivatives. So the, the residency at Symbiotica also facilitated an introduction to basic um, genetic engineering processes. And I learned techniques to introduce red and green fluorescent proteins, um, which are derived from marine invertebrates, um, such as jellyfish into the hex cells, which enabled them to then grow, um, glow red or green under specific light conditions. So these techniques are, of course, highly established processes, and they're used quite routinely in research labs um, for a whole range of processes, um, including cell marking, live cell imaging, studying gene expression, and also observing the spread of disease. Um, but they're also, of course, um, we've become very popularized in the art world by Eduardo Katz's famous transgenic GFP bunny, um, in which the artist claimed to have created the first um, um, genetically modified GFP glowing bunny. So regardless of the relative routine of um, fluorescent proteins in both science and art, I found it fascinating to observe firsthand um, the ability to transfer genetic material from different species and to facilitate new characteristics, but also how these um, processes further complicate traditional species and tax taxonomic distinctions, but also in a sense, a, recon of, a, um, a recognition of how we um, human and more than human are kind of already set up to do this, um, to sort of share genetic material. 
And one of the works that I produced as an outcome from the residency was the work HEC293T, The Transformation of Joni or Oliver, which consisted of a mixed media sculpture and video work incorporating um, tissue culture flasks with fixed um, genetically engineered cells from the experiments conducted um, at Symbiotica on the base of them, which were integrated into the video. And the work also included um, taxidermy butterflies and a range of unsettling elements that started to merge um, human and what would be considered um, non-human to highlight um, interconnections and potentials for, um, for further transformation, as well as the uncanny nature of bioengineered microorganisms that incorporate um, genetic material from viruses and from other organisms and really do transgress um, traditional boundary distinctions. So more recently, my work has increasingly focused on um, notions of immortality and the concept of genetic legacy. And this interest um, was in many ways a move on from this sort of earlier work um, with immortal cells, um, but also a result of my own situation as a single woman in the latest stages of reproductive viability. And this really prompted me to consider how I might be able to use um, new and emerging biotechnologies to establish an alternative genetic legacy beyond necessarily giving birth to human offspring. So the initial exploration um, sort of mapped a range of potential processes and was very much in, inspired by genetic engineering, but also um, other emerging technologies such as gene therapy, which allow the integration of genetic material into host organi organisms alongside scientific insights in um, in relation to the presence of um, viral DNA in the human genome. So I found that really, really interested, uh, interesting because it is now largely accepted that um, humans contain up to 8% viral DNA from ancestral infection and that the integration of viral information um, from, those, uh, from those infections may have actually facilitated the transition to um, placental birth in mammals. Um, sort of starting to signal that viruses likely um, have a really significant role to play in the evolution of um, organisms. So drawing on a lot of these ideas, I developed the work um, self-portrait number two, site of infection for the 2019 show Pandemic, which was curated by um, Toby um, Juliff at the Plimsoll Gallery in Hobart. And that show was developed to coincide with the 100 year anniversary of the 2018-2019 um, global Spanish influenza pandemic. Um, but I guess in retrospect, um, the show really was also a sort of strange predictor for the 2019-2020 outbreak of COVID-19. Um, so the work that you can see um, on these slides consisted of a wax cast of my bust, um, which was rendered in a style similar, reminiscent of kind of cl um, classical depictions of deities or gods. And it sort of emits this um, vapor and that vapor um, contained my DNA. And by incorporating this sort of DNA breath, the work really alluded to the idea of using viral infection as a potential mechanism of uh, proliferating my genetic material. Um, essentially, I was speculating that by genetically engineering viruses to include fragments um, of my genetic code, I might be able to infect other organisms, including humans, and use the virus as a mechanism um, to reproduce bits of my genetic um, material within that host body. I also thought that by using a retrovirus and then also targeting germ cells um, such as sperm cells and egg cells, I might actually be able um, to allow that um, that uh, it might be possible for those little um, that selected DNA sequences to also be then passed on to the host offspring. 
So in that way, I could pass on a kind of portion of my genetic information without having children of my own, because other people and their children would essentially be hosts and continue to perpetuate a piece of me in perpetuity. Um, so this work really was um, designed to be deliberately provocative and to sort of start to highlight a lot of the uncomfortability that many of us experience at the a prospect of infection, especially now, I think, and also the idea of genetic contamination. Um, so, um, and, and that is also sort of despite my view, which really does follow on from Timothy Morton's assertion that we are not so much individuals, but um, rather part of a mesh or a multi-species sort of ecology comprised of um, shared and, and swapped um, genetic material. So, you know, it was also sort of questioning um, starting to question that need of um, a kind of individual genetic leg um, lineage. So more recently, my work has returned um, to cell culture and um, particularly the prospect of establishing an immortalized cell line from my own body via a range of processes such as using viral um, genes, such as again, um, SV40, um, T antigens to disrupt um, programmed cell death. And while there is um, a predecessor, the Billy Apple cell line, which was established by the artist Craig Hilton in 2010, the desire to produce my own cell line has really developed um, from my experiences of uterine um, pathology. Um, so essentially, the proposition really follows a two year stint of being really, really unwell. And after quite a long delay um, in 2019, I was finally diagnosed with a large fibroid, which is essentially a benign tumorous growth of the uterus um, that is quite common in women of sort of later reproductive age. So just um, a, a, hint, a, a heads up that some of the up, upcoming slides feature blood clots and a tumour. So um, I'm hoping that won't be too disturbing for viewers. Um, but essentially, um, you know, to relieve um, a whole range of symptoms, I did, I needed to undergo surgery um, to remove the mass. And that actually allowed me to see an opportunity to not only harvest um, tissue from the fibroid, but also to use the project as a mechanism to explore the kind of prevailing cultural attitudes towards women in relation to fertility and motherhood, but also to use my experiences of um, seeking a diagnosis um, to reveal how women are often treated within a medical domain. So for example, um, despite having a really great GP, um, it really took a while um, to receive a diagnosis. Um, and that was partly because um, period pain, even quite extreme pain is often dismissed. It definitely was by my mother um, as something that is really common and re generally doesn't really warrant further investigation. And it was only when I had accumulated evidence um, such as not realizing that I'd broken my arm because the pain was insignificant in comparison um, to period pain that I'd ex experienced and also starting to collect um, um, these sort of huge blood clots, um, it became really, um, you know, evident that, that, that my situation really did warrant a formal scan. So when I was diagnosed, the origin, original assumption by medical staff also seemed to be that preserving fertility was not really a necessity. Um, because of my age um, and that, and this was really much evidenced in the kind of treatments that were suggested, including ablation, um, which, would have, which would have been less invasive, but would have compromised um, my ability to conceive, but also, um, you know, hysterectomy was put on the table to relieve the symptoms. So it really showed that because I was, um, you know, over 40, it, they, they didn't think that that was, um, that was something that needed to be preserved. Um, but it also really made me aware that despite the relatively low chance of having children, it was an expected future that I was not really ready to give up altogether. 
So prior to having the tumour removed, and I'm going to go through these slides quite quickly because I am aware of the time, um, I developed a solo show which was titled More Morning Story, Expectations, Absences and the Potentials for Self-Persistence that really tried to give some insight into my experiences of situational childlessness and the grief that can also accompany that experience, but also the problematic constructions of womanhood that reinforce um, traditional gender expectations, including assumed motherhood. So I'll just sort of flick through some of these um, slides quite quickly, um, but you can see um, the works actually included a range of different elements, including marquetry panels that made reference to the Victorian language of flowers, particularly around constructions of femininity and sort of hidden ish in the center were um, these blood clots. Um, I also produced a painting um, called, in collaboration with Anita Gowers and Phil Blacklow, who also um, assisted with the marquetry. Um, we worked together. Um, that also talked a, a, um, about um, the way in which these kind of mythological construction of idealized femininity continue to, to haunt us and um, also start to influence um, medical knowledge so that there isn't really that um, clear separation. Um, here you can also see a work, Time is Topological, which consisted of these sort of ticking clocks and a bleeding table. And in one of the anatomical models that I um, sort of repurposed, there was the, the, the snake that was featured in the belly. And that was, again, making this sort of reference to, um, you know, uh, the, the idea of the wandering womb and the way in which, um, you know, the and this is sort of the belief that um, the uterus wanders around the, about the body of a woman like a wild animal causing mischief. And it's that condition that causes major illnesses, um, including hysteria in women. And this is a view that um, is documented in medical texts from ancient Greece, including the Hippocratic Corpus, um, but also, as Amy um, Kerber points out in her book from um, Hysteria to Hormones, ha has seen many different manifestations that it also evolved into the 20th century view that women's um, sort of so-called irrationality is really just linked to their hormones. Um, so other works in the series, um, such as the Memento Mori series and the life-size sculpture, coming to terms with being forgotten, give insight into ideas around, um, into ideas of mourning and mourning for lost possibilities, but also start to signal that um, because we're already connected into um, this sort of history of genetic, this long history of genetic continuous continuance that links us to all organisms, um, you know, and deep time histories, the idea of establishing a genetic legacy um, is really unnecessary. So that was sort of um, the work coming to terms with being forgotten, you know, maybe it's okay um, to just die and form part of a larger cycle that extends beyond us. So the final work in the series, again, connects us back to um, sort of some of the ideas that I've explored um, previously, and particularly the desire to establish a cell line. And it really alludes to the next stage of project development, which um, aims to establish a cell line from the fibroid tissue. And by incorporating, you can see there a flask um, that has fixed primary skin cells of mine, um, which were from another project. Um, and also, again, incorporating taxidermy butterflies and different uncanny elements, the work starts to make a direct reference back to um, HEC293T, the transformation of Joni or Oliver. So really signalling the potential um, for the fibroid cells, not only to be um, to establish a single cell line, but to potentially spawn a range or, again, a tribe of daughter cells um, that like the original intention of the Billy Apple cell line could be used for both scientific and creative um, research endeavours. So since this body of work was shown, my fibroid has been removed and I was really fortunate to get ethics clearance in time and find um, wonderful collaborators from the School of Medicine, 
Associate Professor Brad Sutherland and Joe Marie Courtney, who have isolated, cultured and frozen those cells um, from the tissue. And here you can actually see um, the, the cells that were um, derived, which do look to me like fibroblasts, um, partly also because, you know, they're very common in skin and connective tissue. So I'll leave it there because that does bring us up to date in terms of, you know, where I am, where, where my investigations are current, currently sitting. And I've been fortunate enough to receive um, a, an ANAT Synapse grant um, from, um, from ANAT, which will allow me to actually continue this investigation and to work closely with a range of um, amazing collaborators. Um, so I am really aware of the time, um, but I would just like to um, finish um, by acknowledging, again, the many organisations and um, the people that have supported um, the projects that I've discussed today um, across QUT, um, Symbiotica, UTAS, and of course, also Alice and the original donor of the HEC 293 um, cells. And I'll stop sharing there. So thank you, everyone, um, for listening. Thank you much, Svenja. Yeah, just stay on, on camera. Um, we've got a little bit of time. Selena, if, we, if you could join us, um, turn on your mic and your camera. Um, we've got a little bit of time for um, questions. Um, there's a question specifically to you, Svenja. It's in the Q&A if you want to pop it up, but otherwise I'll read it out. Um, uh, it's from Liani Burton. Uh, the 2020 reckoning via the Black Lives Matter Matters movement drew attention to the HELA cell line and legacy as a form of racial injustice, as well as non-consensual use of genetic material. Can you comment on your ethical position in cell use, especially on Alice's cells, and if you decided in part to use your own cells to circumvent any ethical dilemmas associated with, with cell use? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question. And, you know, as Lainey sort of um, pointed out there, the HeLa cell line is the first human cell line that was ever established. It was in the 1951, but it was established um, from an African-American woman without her consent, and it caused major distress to her family. So there is that sort of history that accompanies the use of cell lines, and particularly the HeLa cell line, where issues of consent are absolutely of paramount importance. And I think that that is um, something that I'm really interested in addressing is actually kind of going well you know for me it is important to make sure that there is a transparency and that I can give consent to use the cells the history of the um, of the SAS 2 cell line um, is is not known so a lot of the um, the cell lines you would have seen are de-identified so I don't actually know who the um, who the donor was for the SARS-2 cell line. And to be honest, I didn't actually investigate that in depth to try to find out. Um, but in many ways, I think her cells start to represent a lot of these sort of unnamed donors. So for me, it is, it is part of that is to start to address issues of consent in um, the project, in the, in the further development of that project and absolutely issues um, particularly around um, differences in access, differences, um, you know, in people's experience definitely have to come into it because, you know, I'm in a very privileged position to have the opportunity to be able to make those choices, which absolutely not everyone is afforded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh... Okay, I don't know that that's a question. Liani has just popped up there. That's great. Selena, I, I wanted to turn to you. You mentioned um, uh, solastalgia, which I always have a little bit of trouble um, pronouncing. And I'm interested in you talking a little bit more about that because you've, you've described beautifully about how a lot of your work is about bearing witness. But I'm curious to... Um, to find out to what degree this idea of solastalgia informs your practice and indeed is providing a space for audiences through your work to mourn, really. I think it's a feeling rather than a thought, solastasia. Yeah. So it's really um, something that I've experienced, as I said in when I was talking, um, trying to return to somewhere and it not being there. 
and it's this disassociated um, memory to place that no longer exists. And I think that mourning is an incredibly powerful mechanism for bringing people into the ecological space. I think it's also, solastasia feels like a very settler term because they would reckon that First Nations have had that experience for a really long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, do you, you talked also about the, the massive fires. Do you think that's, um, that's shifted things for you in terms of your practice and particularly related to this? you know, the fires of 2019 and 2020? Uh, I think that it was significant for a lot of people. I feel as though because it was so palpably evident that there was a huge ecological threat that um, spread out across and, you know, beyond communities, those kind of false borders were um, dissolved in the fire. Um, in terms of myself, like it was raining ash where I live, but we weren't, um, you know, affected in the same way that many people were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Svenja, it, and I was struck as you were talking ab about um, um, the idea as um, Selena touched on this idea of bearing witness that in a way you could, you could think about your practice too, uh, in terms of that framework um, um, I wonder if that does resonate for you and if it does, you know, how it does. I think, you know, for me, you know, I think there are some in nice intersections with Selena's practice, but we operate sort of quite differently. So for me, I find I really do think it's important to immerse yourself within an environment. The environment that I immerse myself into is very much that the kind of lab environment, that kind of scientific terrain. But it's also, you know, about um, developing I guess, a bit of a sensitivity to the organisms you're working with, to some of the deeper implications of those technologies. So, you know, I think um, th there is, but it operates re really, really differently, I think. Yeah. I, th I think, look, I think for, for, for me, with both of you, that, that idea of bearing witness to the things that um, are unseen in some way and how valuable that is through both of your practices in really different ways um, you know, Svenja, you talk, you know, you're dealing with cell lines and stuff like that. And, and, and this is all stuff that is, yes, hidden to us in many ways. And, and I feel like that, that a lot of your work brings that out, um, um, interview. And similarly with, um, Selena, I think so often with environmental issues, it's because it's around the corner or across the hill or whatever. And you know, it's not in your day to day, um, uh, I mean, it, it is imp impacting there as well, but it's uh, there's something about you bringing that into maybe into the middle of Hobart, for example, what's happening, you know, externally. So I feel like there's a lovely synergy between both of you in that sense. So I want to thank you both for um, two really evocative and interesting presentations today. And... Um, and we'll look forward to seeing what next works you do. I, I'll be very excited to see what comes out of the Synapse residency for you, Svenja, and also Selena, um, where you decide to take your practice. Thanks so much for sharing um, your thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everyone that joined us as well. <laughs>